All right, welcome everyone to our latest edition of AJOT Authors and Issues. Here on the Authors and Issues series, we like to talk to authors about their research and other things to help bridge the gap between research and practice. My name is Stacey Reynolds and I am the Editor-in-Chief of AJOT and co-hosting with me today is the AJOT student representative, Sabrina Hinckley, who is an OTD student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And our guests today are Dr. Karen Kepner from the Southern California University of Health Sciences, Dr. Carol Lambden Patavina from the University of New England Occupational Therapy Department, Dr. Tracy Jalaba from the University of Southern California Chan Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy Department, Dr. Melinda Casalino from the Occupational Therapy Department at Ithaca College School of Health Sciences and Human Performance, and Steve Nowatniak from Compass Recover Coaching. Hopefully I got all of those correct. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're excited to have you and we're gonna be talking about the article that you just published in AJOT entitled, Preparing and Responding to the Current Mental Health Tsunami, Embracing Mary Riley's Call to Action. So to start us off, can you each just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself, your name, and maybe where you're Zooming in from? And I'll have Karen, if you don't mind getting us started. Sure. I'm Karen Kepner, um, and I am actually Zooming in. I'm in Costa Rica right now. <laughs> it's nice and warm. <laughs> okay. I think we're all jealous now. How about you, Tracy? Yeah. Hi, Tracy Jalaba, and I'm, I'm coming from Los Angeles. Normally nice and warm, but we're getting a lot of rain right now. So <laughs> not as nice and warm right now. Did hear about that. And Steve. Yep. Steve from Buffalo, New York. And I am trying to keep my cat at bay. <laughs> uh, Mindy. Mindy, I'm here from Ithaca, New York. All right. And Carol. Yeah, I'm zooming in from Portland, Maine. And I think we're a degree or two colder than Costa Rica. <laughs> and I apologize for my voice, but it's a little scratchy today. So you guys are literally from all over the place. And I need to know, like, what is the history behind writing this article together? How did the idea for this paper emerge? And how did all of you end up working on it? So the group of us represents a good portion of the AOTA special interest section or the mental health special special interest section. And the idea and the conceptualization came from that group. Um, a few of us decided that we would continue on the idea and actually draft a paper. Um, I think it started off with a lot of our conversations being a little frustrated with the, the state of OT in mental health at the moment. Right. Um, do you remember like a specific conversation that was had that that led to this or a moment where you're like, we need to write this up? You know, I think, you know, our um, our committee really has been all about creating a framework of connection and kind of putting mental health center stage. I mean, that certainly is on the AOTA agenda. And we really felt it was important to kind of circle back and let folks know that you know, we're at a tipping point in terms of mental health across the nation. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to demonstrate what it is that we do, um, our role on the mental health care team, uh, whether it's, you know, across the continuum. And I think that our desire to connect folks, not just not only those who are working in dedicated mental health spaces, but all practitioners who need to be addressing mental health and wellness. We, we really wanted to bring everybody together around this critical issue that is just, it's not, it's not relegated only to mental health practitioners. This is everybody's issue. And I think that was a big piece of why we wanted to kind of put that back in front of folks via the issue is. Great. Well, that leads us into the title of your article, which again is Responding to the Current Mental Health Tsunami, Embracing Mary Riley's Call to Action. So the question is, what is the mental health tsunami that you talk about and what does Mary Riley have to do with it? I can start. Um, so I think the tsunami metaphor, there's sort of like two pieces that resonated with us. One is this idea of like a wave, right? Like there's this huge 
um, wave coming at us that sort of was this combination of a lot of different things that have been transpiring in our society in the past few years. We have the COVID-19 pandemic all the political and social unrest that was going on and, and all of these different things that were really having a huge impact, negative impacts on people's mental health. Um, and then I think this idea too of a tsunami being like a natural disaster, right? Really speaks to that, to us, that disastrous state that our current mental health care system is in. And then where does Mary Riley come from? How did she get dragged into this? Mary Riley gets dragged into everything, <laughs> and, which means it was a very impactful, you know, career and certainly a very impactful Slago lecture. You know, she really talks about, and, and thank you, Tracy, I think she really summed that up really, really well. Yeah. I think for those of us working in dedicated mental health spaces, we've known this wave was coming, right? Um, but I don't think anybody else realized how in shambles our, our mental health as a nation is. Um, but also our mental health care system is. We knew it, but I think it took COVID. COVID was the proverbial, you know, wave hitting the shore. And then everybody kind of kind of woke up to the idea that, oh, wow, it's not just those folks over there. It's me too, because there were now so many folks who could relate to depression, anxiety, isolation, you know, all of, the, of those things. But Mary Riley really talks about you know, OT is kind of, you know, the best undiscovered thing that's happened um, in that century. Of course, it was in the last century, but um, I feel that's kind of where we are now. There's a mental health care worker shortage, a big one. Um, I was just kind of checking on stats earlier today, and, and the numbers range anywhere from about 140 people to every mental health care worker in uh, I think it was Massachusetts, all the way to 850 people per one mental health care worker in Alabama. So we have a massive shortage. So we're really at a tipping point now, which is our time, our time to capture some space. Obviously, you know, we all believe in the power of occupation, the transformative power of occupation, but other folks don't know what we're really capable of in the mental health space because we got out of it long before the people who are working in it now ever entered the field. So their experience of occupational therapy is typically in a more medical setting or a pediatric setting and not so much mental health. So, you know, she really talks about the time being now and that we also, you know, her famous quote, you know, man through the use of his hands, Etc. That's the most famous quote, right? It's actually not my favorite quote. My favorite quote is is the one about um, occupation being very, very unbelievable, extraordinary, but also very commonplace, right? So it doesn't look like we're doing a whole lot because we're using everyday occupations as both a means and an end. And so, but we uh, she calls on us to embrace that and to to honor that for the power that it has. And we need to be shouting that from the rooftops across all practice settings. And I also think, kind of going back to your first question, Stacey, is, which is another reason why we really wanted this paper out here now at this moment. And we use the issue is as a platform for it. We wanted to make some very clear practical suggestions um, for the mental health that OT can, that OT can improve to for people to start really thinking about how OT can be involved. And we thought that this was a good platform for it. That's great. And I think that plays into Sabrina's question, if she wants to go ahead and jump in here. Yeah. So um, you identified, you know, a few challenges in your article, but one of the key challenges that you talked about um, was that people outside of OT don't really understand um, that OT can play a role in improving mental health. So I'm sure you guys have all been asked this question. People outside of our profession often, you know, they wonder what is OT? And I'm sure like, you know, I know me and all our pe my peers, we all have our elevator pitch at, for our explanations. Um, but for the question, I was just wondering if someone were to ask you what makes OT qualified to treat people with mental health challenges in this area, how would you respond?
what I'll answer that a little bit. Um, one of the things that I find is I kind of look at it a foot in a couple different worlds. So on one token, I'm a licensed occupational therapist. I also have my own mental health condition with a bipolar condition. And I put that out there because I'm in a safe place job wise to be able to disclose and try to help demystify and destigmatize the mental health space. And what I find is that there's really three things that are done for a person to live well with a mental health condition, with a mental illness. One is um, softening the intensity of symptoms. The second is to be able to have a more empowering relationship with the internal dialogue or the discomfort associated with the symptoms. But then there's also having a lifestyle that allows you to live a fulfilling, meaningful life while accommodating the needs of the condition. And what I find that occupational therapy really does, is it helps create, it helps an individual create a lifestyle that supports the needs of the, and of, of accommodating the needs of the symptoms and also softening the intensity of the symptoms. Steve, I love the way you just described that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's men, medicine by itself can't solve the problem and it never will. Um, it's a tool and part of the bigger process of living well. And I think that's a big piece too of what we bring to the table. And that is that um, we really honor the human experience, right? This is not about trying to pathologize human experience, which is very common, even in mental health care. You know, it's a, it's all a problem that we have to do away with. We have to solve it, get rid of it. And I think occupational therapy practitioners are very good at honoring the human experience and, and really listening um, for all the ways in which the person desires to enact themselves in the world, right? And the way that we enact ourselves in the world, we call occupation, right? Occupation isn't something out there. We are occupational beings. The tools and materials and equipment is outside of us, but we are occupation. And the way that we enact ourselves in the world is a direct reflection of how safe we feel, how competent we feel with ourselves, with other people and with the environment. And so when you have, you know, when you're experiencing, you know, a range of emotional states or you're experiencing psychosis, that can create um, what feels like a very kind of unsafe space to be in. And so I think one of the roles for us as occupational therapy practitioners is to help create those safe spaces for people to embrace their human experience. And, and I think that's one of the things that we, we need to be bringing to mental health care. And that is a de-emphasis on pathologizing all things mental health. And, and we do a lot of that in this country. I just wanna add one more thing about the role of OT that I've kind of heard, but is we go into the, we create those safe spaces, we meet folks in the context that they're in, but we also really focus on providing a purpose right? Like folks need to feel some kind of purpose in what they're doing. And I think unlike the majority of mental health practitioners, occupational therapy, we bring that to the table. I love that. And it leads so well into my question. Um, and bear with me, I'm going to quote from your article, but I really loved the statement. Um, it it says, and I'm quoting, air quoting with my fingers, um, where therapeutic use of self, activity, and occupation are the primary tools of the occupational therapy professionals working in mental health spaces, these therapeutic mediums are often perceived by others to lack sophistication and therefore lack efficacy when compared to the more medical model intervention frameworks. So in my mind, not only do we have to advocate to be in mental health spaces, because as you said earlier, we've been out of them for a while um, as a profession, but we also have to be able to justify and support the use of our, again, air quoting, simplistic interventions. Um, so I, I guess the question is, with that challenge in mind, um, we, we know we have research that says that occupational therapy is beneficial in some realms, but what would help support mental health practice specifically? What are the gaps in the research that really need to be filled? Are there gaps? I would I would say there, I mean, there's obviously a lot of gaps, I think from my perspective. Um, but I do think that 
OT has more evidence than a lot of OT practitioners believe. And I think that there is a lot, if we uncovered from other professions, we still can borrow from other professions and adapt interventions from other professions to be occupation-based or occupation-centered in their focus. Um, I think that there's a lot, just from a personal kind of professional standpoint, I think there's a lot of work we can do with sensory processing and sensory modulation in adult populations in particular, um, because I think that is a very unique gap that occupational therapists, occupational therapy professionals in general have a lot of knowledge about. And I see a lot of other professions starting to recognize that. And I think if we can get in and get and get in there running and demonstrating our value and how you can apply that to occupation, I think we would we would be better received by other professions and also kind of establishing our credibility. Um, but that's my take on the research only because I think it's probably partially based on some of my other research I'm doing too. <laughs> what about other folks? What would support OT practice in the settings that you're most familiar with? And it doesn't have to be research. I guess I was thinking of like, what have we come armed with to really justify what we already kind of know works? But what would support that? Stephen? Yeah, I think one of the most powerful, well, my experience has been the most powerful thing that a person can provide inside of the mental health space is therapeutic use of the self. It's the relationship that provides hope. It's the relationship that provides opportunity. It's the relationship of sitting with someone during their discomfort and chaos, letting them know they're not alone and exploring what could be done in that space. That's what provides hope and opportunity. And I think that one thing that I think is really important is that there's what we do, but there's how we do it. And the peer movement is a whole civil rights movement of people with lived experience of the system saying the system is disempowering and oppressive. And when you look at what the peer supporters and the national guidelines for peer supporters to do, they created 12 values of what peer support is all about. And what I think that we as professionals, healthcare professionals, what we really need to do is listen to that because that is the how it should be developed in order for it to be empowering. So I think a really important space for us to do is really listen to the peer movement, understand the values that the peer supporters say are important and incorporate that into how we deliver our services. That's great. And we'll get the resource for that or a link for that uh, to post below the video um, so people can access that and learn more. Carol, did you want to add to that? I think it goes along with what Stephen was saying in terms of, um, you know, we continually want to have a seat at the table, but I think we need to think about what table we want to be sitting at, right? And I prefer to be sitting at the table with folks with lived experience who can vocalize what it is that they really want and what it is that they really need instead of always trying to, and I, and I, you know, the system is obviously flawed, it's privileged, and we need to be the ones that are breaking down those barriers. I know Steve and I presented at um, a conference, ISPS, which is the International Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to Psychosis, just to get the word of OT out there to other professions, folks with lived experience, care providers of folks with lived experience. And, you know, it's really important that we we are strategic about our partners, you know, I, and, and I don't think that partnering with those with lived experience has really been a high priority. And that's something that we really need to focus on. Get, stop preaching, you know, stop, this is a, stop preaching, not preaching to the choir, but, you know, trying to sit at the table with medicine. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, um, I'm not certainly against getting medical care, but so much of mental unwellness in this country, including DSM, and I'm going to air quote that, DSM diagnoses are rooted in disconnection, are rooted in trauma, rather than something that can be healed by taking a pill. Don't get me wrong. Many people are helped. But we have also have a lot of evidence to show that in the long run, psychotropic medications are actually can can be damaging to people and they should have choices about the way in which they want to receive mental health care services. 
And so I also want to add that I think we need to be looking to um, our colleagues in occupational science. We need to be doing that work around general mental health and wellness and what creates those states and what creates states of mental unwellness. Because that, the folks that are doing that kind of work in OS are really going to provide such a rich, um, you know, repository of, of information for us that we can use. And I would also argue that we have to push against the system. Quantitative data is not all there is. You cannot relegate human experience to stats. You just can't do it. And we have to wrap our heads around that. And we have to rage against the machine, if you will. And I think that's a big part of what this committee has really been about is pushing back. Just because mental health care says it so, doesn't make it right. And that's what we have to wrap our heads around. That's great. I know I went before, but I just want to piggyback one small thing um, on what Carol was saying. And that is we also need to be aware of the ableism that we exist with. Because right now the system, and I'm speaking from experience from a bipolar condition, the whole thing is based on the bipolar is wrong and it's a sickness that needs to get fixed. So fundamentally I'm flawed that needs to get fixed. That's different than recognizing that I have a different condition that needs to be accommodated. And so I think that when you have the system that says fundamentally I'm flawed and I'm always going to need some external thing to fix me, then I have a life where I'm wrong all the time. But that's different than just recognizing here's what these human experience is like for you. And now you just need to spend time getting to know what it's like and how it shows up in your body so you can have so you can address its needs and, and have the life that you want. It's like instead of looking at it like an illness, like a chemical imbalance, like diabetes, it's more like a condition like nearsightedness. So when you have the tools to function with it, you can drive a car and do what you want. You don't have the glasses on. You can wreak havoc in your life and the life of people around you. But it's a tool and skills to develop, not this chemical balance that needs to get fixed. My personal opinion. I really like... Oh, sorry, Stacy. No, I, I also say, it's a great analogy. That's all. Thank you, Steve. You kind of remind me too of some work that I think OTs and or, or OT professionals and occupational scientists scientists can really contribute well to, or these system systemic changes that could happen. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on the environment and how it impacts engagement, pro-social behaviors, and looking at how we can support people who have, you know, various lived experiences through systemic changes. And I think OT and OS have a lot to offer there as well. That's great. Thank you, guys. I really like that analogy that you use. I that it just, it makes so much sense. <laughs> um, so as we know, there is a limited group of OTs dedicated to the mental health field. And we often refer to these individuals as mental health OTs. Um, so in your paper, you kind of specifically wrote about how there's kind of a discrepancy, I guess, between these, this term, I guess. Um, so is your paper written specifically for people in this group, or do you hope to reach a larger audience? And then for those reading this paper, what do you want, like the big takeaway for them? I think the we wanted to speak to both groups. I think I'm speaking for the group <laughs> um, in terms of mental health OTs and OTs, because our argument is that all OTs deal with mental health. Um, so you can't really separate it out. There is There are a group of o OT professionals who work in designated mental health spaces. Um, and so we have to recognize that they have a specialized expertise. But I also believe that our group was trying to to include everyone in this in addressing this broken mental health system that we do have, because we all can take a part. Does anybody else want to add to that? Um, I kind of had a follow up, which was, what, where do you see the most overlap? Like, like Karen, you brought up mental health and SI. Um, and, and thinking about from that environmental perspective, like that's the space I lived in for a long time, sensory modulation disorders. And it's like, 
you couldn't necessarily tease out the modulation issues from the anxiety and the hypervigilance and and things like that. And and we didn't necessarily try to always treat the underlying issue. A lot of times we were providing the supports in the environment. We were coaching families. We were, um, you know, changing lifestyle routines and things like that. So to me, that's a really obvious overlap because I lived in that space. But where are some of those other places where you just can't tease mental health apart from other areas of practice? Are there other kind of big ones that come to mind in, in your own experiences? Worked a little bit in Think rehab, phys rehab. I'm sorry, Mindy, go ahead. I, I've talked a lot. <laughs> Finish okay. your thought, Stephen, and then we can go to Mindy. Yeah. You can't, how can you not have an internal emotional mental health process if you're dealing with an amputation, if you're dealing with a stroke, if you're, you're, whenever you're dealing with that, you have internal chaos, you have an internal journey that's going to be incorporating with this recalibration of existence and, and being able to find how you do things and, and redo it. So any illness, any injury has a mental health component to it. There, there, there is no separation there. And I think that if we don't acknowledge that emotional state that a person's going through in their recovery journey, then we are not helping the individual. Great. Yeah, I always, uh, the, oh, go ahead. No, the I students, think a great point. Go ahead, Mindy. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm just to ping off what Steve was just saying. Um, I always say, I'll tell the students that I work with is, are, are the people that we work with are meeting us at a really bad time in their life, right? So just as humans might, but what, what I was going to say that to your question, Stacey, was um, trauma, trauma-informed care, um, right in line with that. I mean, that's where we opened up about the pandemic and just think about, you know, in the school districts, I mean, that's tons of OTs are working in school districts. You can't separate from trauma and trauma-informed care. And I know Carol did a great show on that last year, um, probably not show, but you know what I mean? Um, last year, you and your colleagues at the specialty conference um, that I thought really blew me away, actually, made me look at it in a whole different line way. Because not only is it for OTs who work specifically in mental health area arenas, it's all of us are dealing with trauma all the time from, as Stephen mentioned, the amputee, the person who just suffered that and they're in the hospital to second graders who are in school for the first time from after the pandemic. I mean, trauma is uniform. I would like to add that I think that there's a lot of emerging areas of practice that are coined by AOTA, you know, or whatever the, you know, whoever's defining the emerging areas of practice. But I think there's a lot of emerging areas of practice where mental health intersects. Um, I would say like criminal justice, um, work in post-secondary settings, the transition to adulthood. Um, I think there's a lot of places where OTs are, OT professionals are are showing up, but that they're finding that, yes, there's life skill deficits, but then it's kind of intersects with trauma and, and mental health conditions. I was just thinking, um, working with refugees as another example. Or unhoused populations, um, a lot of OTs moving into that space and obviously a lot of mental health needs there. Carol? Oh, excuse me. What? Goodness. My voice is really going. Um, I think, you know, the healthcare system does not support outside of, well, even in mental health spaces, it doesn't support taking time to create relationships, to create safety. And so as long as that's true, we're going to be on this constant wheel um, the, uh, to nowhere. You know, we keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And all, you know, all I have, all anybody has is my own reality. I filter the world through my own, you know, quote unquote mind that really can't be explained. And so, you know, mental health, as, as Karen said, it's it's everywhere. You can't extricate that. And also, you know, we have to honor the folks who are doing the work in dedicated mental health spaces who do have a whole nother level of expertise when it comes to, you know, specific mental health conditions. But I think what we really need to be focusing on is, again, pushing back against the system that doesn't allow 
people, communities, and populations the time to heal. If you think that somebody is going to enter an inpatient unit and come out three days later, enter with experiencing psychosis and leave three days later and be well, whatever well looks like, that's that's just, I mean, it, it just doesn't even make sense. It's completely nonsensical. But that's what we continue to do. You know, this conveyor belt to move them in, move them out as fast as we can. And we need to, you know, for the sake of money, for the almighty dollar, and we really need to go back to some of the models from, let's say, the 1970s with Soteria House, for example, and there are a few that still exist around the world. But these safe spaces, these home-like environments where people can truly take the time to heal, um, that's the route we need to be going. And so we really need to be put, and that, it doesn't mean that the work out there, people aren't doing good work. They are. But we're, we're trying to do this work in a healthcare system that doesn't allow space for people to truly heal. And that's really problematic. Great point. So I guess it leads into the next question. And, and I really appreciated in your article that there were a lot of action steps. There were a lot of like, here are things that we can start to do better. Um, and you listed those kind of at the individual level, at the professional kind of organizational level, state and community and national levels. Um and we know all of those have to change. Like, I, I agree, like broken system. But in your opinion, as people are starting to acknowledge the tsunami and really get behind this, um, where do we need to start? Where would you start if you could pick? Like, what what is the best place to start? And then where do we go from there in terms of making change? My 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 recommendation would just be banding together, networking and supporting each other. You know, it's we can't we can't rely on AOTA or the national organizations to do all the work. We have to we have to be determined and dedicated to doing the work and kind of gathering the troops, I guess, would be my my recommendation. And and to that end, this committee started the mental health special intersection interstate consortium. So yes, so we're banding together um, state rep and mental health SIS representatives or the equivalent across all states and territories, meeting quarterly and then doing the work in between. So, because what we found was everybody was looking to AOTA, MHSIS to solve state issues and we can't do that. So we decided the best way that we could help is help everybody band together at more of a grassroots level. So I think, you know, I think that's right on point. We have to get, you know, we have to take political stances. You have to be in the know about what's happening in terms of in terms of legislation. And we have to, you know, I don't know if I have an order, but we have to get, you know, access other organizations and professions to let them know the work that we're doing. And we also, in our own little, you know, corner of the world, not run out of the room when somebody starts to cry. Not, you know, open up those conversations, be willing and be willing to push back against the system when they say, oh, no, 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 you gotta go, you gotta move on, push back. I know that's hard, it's not easy, but it can be done. And, and everybody pushing back creates a greater wave tsunami of people pushing back. That's great. Tracy? Yeah, I would just add to, um, I think, you know, we're always we're with our clients, right? Trying to find that just right challenge. So I think like also, you know, using like, yes, we want to sort of push ourselves, right? To be doing more and doing different things and getting involved. But I think also meeting yourself where you're at and like looking to what your personal skills and resources and network provides. Um, all of these things are important and you know, I do think, like you said in the article, that we have lots of different ideas for places to get started. So, you know, the place where you're able to start is probably, you know, a good place to start. I just want to add, I just, I'm on a, a local board, which is another recommendation that we have is, you know, be active in your community, let them know what occupation. So I sit on the board of our 
local suicide prevention and crisis services. And I just attended a safe talk training today, right? Which is just, it's an international training for people to deal. Like it's like the first step, like how to notice, how to just mention somebody and then connect them with further help if they're um, experiencing thoughts of suicide. And it was like, it was a three hour workshop. And I'm like, every, I wish every OT took this. It just gives you a tiny bit of courage. I feel like right now, because there has been such a shortage of occupational therapists for a long time working in mental health, you know, strictly mental health settings, there aren't any field work sites. So students don't ever get an experience. They get a couple weeks, they learn some group dynamics, and then they don't actually know what it's like to be in those settings. So they're afraid. They're afraid they're not going to do, they don't even know what they're pushing back against, right? So I, I don't know if AOTA or somebody could, or me, I was just thinking, wow, we should get Safe Talk folks to come to conference, provide these free services so everyone can just be on the same page about some stuff. Like little accessible, practical interventions or ways of being, I think, could go a really long way in this gap in between. big proponent of what we can do ourselves just because we're the only our actions are the only thing that we can control really i mean we can influence things but our, our actions are our control and as many talked about trauma and trauma awareness i really think that we need to look at um trauma safe or trauma awareness as a universal precaution because every human being is an iceberg and it doesn't matter where they come in the system with what you see is only a small tip their history, their background, their experiences, their lifestyle, their their the situations that they've been through, that's a whole component there. And, and anybody could have a traumatic experience or a traumatic history, you don't know. So I think if we look at trauma-informed care as a universal precaution, that can support someone no matter what they have, just like bloodborne pathogens and all that other kind of stuff is done as a universal precaution. So I would think that that's an important piece that anybody can do in any setting to be able to support with that, um, the how we do things. Thank you guys. Sabrina, you wanna jump in? I think we have one more question yeah. for you guys. Yeah, we have one more question. You guys kind of hit on this a little bit, um, but for occupational therapy students, what can we do to help with this reintegration into the mental health scope of practice? And you mentioned some resources that we could use, but are there any other additional resources that are available to people, OT student or not, who just want to learn more about this? The first thing that comes to mind to me is for students not to be scared to ask someone who's been there, has a little more experience, understands. I mean, I think the best resources in some ways are each other. Um, and we get both stu students and clinicians can learn a lot from each other. And, and to piggyback on that, we also started <clears throat> a mentor, mentor, oh my gosh, a mentor mentee program. And students, if you're members of AOTA, you can access that on community. And so that's a way to connect everybody. Um, and yeah, I mean, we do, for example, at our university, I actually supervise, I'm a full-time faculty, but I supervise students in the spring at a non-traditional justice-based site where, you know, all the youth there is coming from really hard places. And so, um, you know, that's another model that works. And, you know, if you can create those spaces, again, we're going to have to start looking out of the box and, stop only looking to what will get paid and what won't get paid. Um, there are many other paths to, to making a living in and around if you wanna work in mental health, but take forward what you know, model the way, even if you're not in a mental health setting, model the way when people are talking, are they using ableist language um, when they're talking about folks who have you know, mental health challenges? Um, what's that dialogue? You know, Even thinking about our own language we use, um, on a daily basis, you know, saying, you know, that's crazy, that's insane, you know, really thinking about how people might perceive that language. 
if you're in and around, you know, folks who have lived experience, they might have a very different understanding of what you might be talking about. And so it's those little things that we can make ostensibly make the world a little bit of a better place. Those are some great recommendations and great starting points. And um, we'll, again, try to make sure that we uh, provide some links for those resources. Um, if you have watched or listened to any of our authors and issues sessions before, you'll know that we like to end every session with a little party game, um, just to lighten things up, up, but also to learn more about you as uh, people, as opposed to just scholars. Um, so we, we have... I have come up with our questions for today. I won't pin this one on Sabrina. Um, around the national event that is happening on Sunday, which is the Super Bowl. Um, so I have five Super Bowl related questions and there are five of you here. So I'm going to give a question to each person. But if you don't know the answer, you can ask one of your teammates. Um so Karen's laughing and I'm thinking she doesn't know anything about the Super Bowl. So I'll ask her the first question, which I think is the easiest one. Um, what two teams are playing in the Super Bowl this Sunday? Can you name one? Oh God, no, it's terrible. I got, <laughs> I got no, I get hardly any news from the U.S. here. I do keep myself in contact, but football is not one. We do play a different kind of football down here. Um, who do I know has been actually decent? The Cleveland Browns. I know we're doing okay. I'm from <laughs> Cleveland. <laughs> I know they were doing okay, but I know they are not in a Super Bowl. I think I had to pass that one on to someone. All right. Who, who can help her out here? What two teams are in the Super Bowl? Steve? I'm from Buffalo, so I have a scar that the Kansas City Chiefs are involved in this whole thing. Um, And that's where my focus and thing has been. And I believe... 49ers are the NFC. That is correct. So but as I said, my scarring has been the Chiefs. <laughs> That's so terrible that that now you remember me cuz or now that I remember, I was I lived in Cleveland Heights, Ohio and one of the those the two brothers that were in the Super Bowl last year went to high school in my city. So I should have known the answer. <laughs> All right, so this is going well so far. Um does uh, let's see. Tracy, who is performing in the halftime show? Oh, I know that. <laughs> Usher. Usher. Very excited. Very excited. Awesome. And I think he's having some other people with him too, but Usher is the main performer. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Carol, do you know who is singing the national anthem? I don't because I'm still licking my wounds that the Ravens aren't there. <laughs> Wait, how are you a Ravens fan? Are you a Baltimore girl? I'm from, well, I'm from the Eastern shore of Maryland. So Okay, we'll have to talk. I'm a Maryland girl. Oh. Can anybody help her out? Does anybody know who's singing the national anthem? It's country. Red hair. Red hair. Oh, not Judd. No, I think she has red hair. Reba, Reba's singing oh, the national Reba. anthem. Should be good. All right, this one anybody can answer. If you are watching the Super Bowl or any football or any sporting event, what snacks and drinks are you going to bring to the game or bring to your couch to enjoy that sporting event? So you guys can all tell us, what are, what are your go-tos for snacks? What do you got, Mindy? Well, pizza. You right. always you always have to have pizza. That is a good snack food. Steve, what do you got? From Buffalo, it's chicken wings with blue cheese. Not <laughs> ranch, blue cheese. And is it buffalo seasoning that's on the wings? It if could be a variety. Buffalo? We've gone, we've got charbecue and hot and mild and all that because I'm mm. a personal barbecue like on the grill type person myself all right carol what about you what snacks or drinks are you bringing to the game chips and dips and can i say it margaritas <laughs> please yes all right chips and dips and margarita karen i was gonna say a good nacho cheese dip is always a crowd favorite 
warmed up in a crock pot. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Tracy, wrap us up. What do we, what else do we need at our Super Bowl party? Yeah. I mean, the chips and dip, I, I, I like a good onion dip. So, you know, maybe that along with the queso, some salsa, some guac. You got to have a variety of dips. I knew Tracy was going to say guacamole because she's from California. <laughs> yeah. I knew. I had to do it. I had to. I had to. That's, Sabrina, that's how I could have fit in avocado today. <laughs> avocado is my keyword. If we were running over time, I was going to be like, I'm going to work avocado into our conversation. <laughs> All right, everybody's predictions really quick. Now that you know who is in the Super Bowl, Kansas City and what are the 49ers? California 49ers? San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. thank you. All right, who's going to win? Steve, what's your prediction? Well, if we're going to lose to a team, we might as well lose to the Super Bowl champions. So I will root for Kansas City. Ooh, Tracy, are you your California girl? Are you going to root for the 49ers? I probably will. Um, but I have to, my prediction is with the Chiefs because, you know, I'm also a Swifty and I just feel like, you know, she's, <laughs> she's going to orchestrate something. I, I feel it. <laughs> I love that. We did have an entire Q&A about Taylor Swift with somebody once. <laughs> so yeah, you would have been great at that one. <laughs> Karen, what do you think? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? I'd say the Kansas City. I'd, I'll, I'd root for them. All right. You're rooting for Taylor Swift, too. I understand. Yeah. All right, Carol, what's your prediction? I got to go with the Chiefs. He's, uh, Travis Kelsey is not going to lose in front of <laughs> T-Swift. Not going to happen. <laughs> Apparently, he's going to propose to her. Oh, I did not heard that. That's the word on the street. So we'll see. I have heard that. <laughs> I wonder if she's heard that. All right, Mindy, bring us home. Who's going to win the Super Bowl this year? Kansas City. Um, All right. There. Well, we'll have to come back and, and see how, how well you guys predicted the outcome of that game. But regardless, you're going to have good food if you decide to watch it, which is really what's important. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. As we wrap up, is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about the work that you're doing or any other resources that you would recommend? Anything that you're like, oh, I forgot to say that. We'd love to hear it now. Not so much in addition, but the only two talking points that I would like listeners to leave with is number one, trauma-informed care is a universal precaution. And number two, it's not just what you do, but how you do it. Thanks, Stephen. That's great. Yeah, well, I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a great conversation. I really think the article is so important and so timely. And this conversation has been a fantastic addition to that, for, especially for people who read the article and want to know more. Or for people who hear this first, and then they can go to the article and read all of the great suggestions and action items that you guys have put into play uh, or put into print. Um, so we appreciate your insight. We appreciate you being here to help translate some of this work into practice. And um, just a reminder that the article will be published in AJOT. Uh, full text and open access. So everybody can read it. They can access it for free on the AJOT website. Um, so spread the word that people can get a hold of this and start doing these good works. Thank you guys so much for being here. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.